Hi everyone, and welcome back to Balkan Sis, the show that's going to help you navigate the massive challenges of life, motherhood, culture, identity, and belonging with more ease, acceptance, joy, and purpose. Thanks to each and every one of you that come back every time to listen, learn, heal, and feel inspired. If you do love the podcast, then do me a huge favor and hit the subscribe button. It really does help spread the word. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Balkan Sis. I know that I say this all the time with everyone that I talk to, but I think today is my favorite. And I know mothers shouldn't have favorites, <laughs> but I think, it's okay. I think it's okay to have favorites because we all do. And I'm beyond thrilled to announce today's guest. Brace yourselves for an absolute powerhouse episode. We're not just diving into a conversation today. We're embarking on a journey of resilience, creativity, and sheer fucking awesomeness. And of course, I'm going to swear because I just can't help it. Um, Nina and I share a bond of childhood displacement, weaving our ways from the Balkans to America and Australia. Nina's narrative takes an epic turn, obviously, from conquering challenges of nursing and motherhood, mental health, creativity. Her trajectory is nothing short of legendary. So I hope you guys can listen along as we navigate through Nina's incredible journey and her awesome style, family dynamics and legacy of breaking intergenerational trauma. It's going to be a good one, guys. Welcome, Nina. It's an absolute honor to have you on our show. Ah, Ivana, thank you so much. That was such a good intro. And I love, you know what I noticed right away? How you say Nina, like you don't say Nina, say Nina, <laughs> like in the Bosnian, Croatian. Shenway. I love that. I love being here with you, my Balkan sister. It's so cool to find women who li you literally lived my same life, except you ended up in a way cooler country. Look, you don't I have love to it. sweat. You don't have to sweat as much as I do. So that's a plus. You wouldn't be able but to wear any of your cool jeans or sweaters or anything. You'd literally be living in bike shorts and crop. If you wanna if you wanna battle this out, then I would lo love to see how you can spend six months in the straight ass winter that I experienced here. Oh my Wisconsin, god, but... let's do it. We can do a live swap. Live <laughs> <laughs> <A wife> swap. <laughs> yeah, we can a wife swap. I don't know about I don't know if my husband can handle you, honestly. <laughs> You're a way more out there than I am. Dude, my husband can barely handle me. Boy, my husband is well trained. So if you ever come, you are more than welcome. Honestly, I can oh. see like as soon as I got in touch with you, I could just see I'm like to our to. I don't know. I don't know how it would look back and just see you coming to Australia, like going to different places. Yeah, just doing tours. And I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure that's on the all these cool things are on the horizon. But do you prefer me calling you Nina or Benina? Nina's You're, fine. Nina's okay. Fine. I love yeah, that. Yeah, that's totally that's fine. A name. It's beautiful. Thank so you. can you take us back to, yeah, your place of origin, where you were born, where you grew up, what town you grew up in? And yeah, a little bit of your life, you know, pre, pre nursing, pre Instagram, pre motherhood and all that jazz. Yeah. So it all started so similar to your story. So I was born in Bosnia and I was born to a Catholic and a Muslim. So my mom and people who are from the Balkans will understand how significant this is. So I have a Catholic mom and a Muslim dad. And as the war broke out, my mom fled the country with my brother. And I think I was around four at the time. And we fled to Germany. And I have some memories of that trip. I was so young. So it was really, it really just flashbacks of certain things I experienced. I remember being on a bus. And it was one of those, I don't know if you guys have these in Australia, but like Van Gelder buses, like not a school bus, but like a little nicer bus with the cushion seats and whatnot. So I remember sitting on the bus and I remember having my pillow and my teddy bear. And I remember they stopped the bus and a bunch of men, I think we were on the border either in Serbia or in Austria. I don't remember which border, but we were crossing a border and they stopped the bus. They made us all get off. And I remember they, my mom, there was a man on the bus with us and he was one of the only men. It was mostly women and children and they were going to not let him go. They were, 
I don't know what, I don't know the whole story, but essentially my mom basically said he was my dad. She saved this man's life. It was crazy. That's one of the memories I have. I remember getting to Germany and then we lived in a refugee camp from God. I think I was maybe seven years old or seven or eight. We lived in the refugee camp and that felt like home to me. It never felt like anything weird like thinking back now and looking back at pictures now I'm like holy shit I cannot believe that I lived Mm -hmm. like that and as as a child that it that was just my normal life we shared we lived in a school building uh, an abandoned school building that was for all the refugees and it was we were part of this program and I don't remember the name of the program but it was Heidenheim Germany and it was a giant classroom. So certain families, and I don't know, I asked my mom this recently. It's like, how did they decide which family got like a room and which family got just in a janitor's closet, which family got what? So my family, my mom and my brother and I, we got a corner of a giant room that they split up with office divider, wall dividers. And we had the corner and that was fun. Like we got to be with all these other cool people and kids. And there was one sink. Everybody had to wash. So you have to wash your face and your hands and whatnot, your feet. I don't remember there being showers. Like I'm, I I don't remember there being showers, but I do remember my brother got chicken pox one year and we got moved to a janitor's closet. That was a room and it had a window and it had a sink. And it had across the hall, it had those half showers that janitors have that are, Mm -hmm. it looks like a shower, but it's just really for filling buckets and stuff. Had one of those. And I remember my mom giving us baths in buckets, like those tiny janitor buckets. And that was just the greatest life. I was living my best life. I never knew anything different. There was a playground. My school was close. We walked to school and Around age seven or eight, we, my mom got a job at a bank and they were able to sponsor her to get an apartment. So we got an apartment, a one bedroom apartment, and that was luxury. And next thing we are going to America and it was so scary. I remember it was like a whole year of going to the doctor getting shots, getting checked up. And I, nothing made sense to me. I, and I didn't feel like my mom it didn't explain anything to us. And being a mom now, I think like I literally tell my kids everything. If we're going somewhere, I prepare them like we're going to the doctor. They're going to do this and this. Yeah. And I just remember my mom I was just like, all right, come on along. This is what's happening. And the next thing we're getting on a bus in the middle of the night. We're driving to the airport. Never been on an airplane. And I was, I think, nine or ten at the time. And we got on the bus. I had my pillow as one thing I remember is always having my favorite pillow. We had one suitcase. We got on an airplane and there was a ton of knowing, knowing what I know now, there was a ton of refugees on this airplane and it was like packed with families like ours. And I remember looking out the window and just being in the clouds and then we came to America and we were at the airport and we had to sit on this bench. And to this day, when I go to Chicago O'Hare airport, every time we go through customs, I see that wall because it's still there. And I picture myself at that age sitting there waiting for somebody to hand us an envelope. And that envelope was our new life. It was our new identity. It had our social security numbers. It had our green cards. It had all the paperwork that we needed to become American residents. And, and then after that, it was like, so everything happened so fast. We were always at the doctor. It felt like we were always at this clinic, like always getting checked up. It's talking about me. I just like, huh? what the fuck do they think we are? Some fucking monkeys? Jeez, why am I getting checked up all the time? This is the fucked up thing that people like you and I, with this, such a similar story, can laugh about these things because a real person, like from a whole other life, like my husband, and I don't know about your husband, it's like it's a movie. It's a movie. Yeah. And, it's like a movie. It's, oh, you get you come to the airport, someone gives his envelope, and then you, then you feel like get these numbers, and you go to the doctor. Like criminals, 
Like, yeah. I feel like they treat you like the immigration centers that we were going to in Chicago. Like we had to go all the time for, I don't even know what I should ask my mom, what the fuck were we doing there every week? I don't know. If, I think you had to prove that you had a job. You had to prove that you had this and that. And I would just remember sitting in the waiting room and every single fucking time they would say Marija. My mom's name is Maria Marija. So I just, it's like core memory. I would, we were getting shots like vac- vaccinated and it was just, that was like the whole first year of my life. And then everything settled down a little bit. And this is why I, I tell people like, this is why I have abandonment issues because I literally my whole life spent my whole life having people taken away from me. My dad, the friends we made in Germany, the friends we made in Chicago. So We lived in Chicago. We lived in a really bad neighborhood. So they place you wherever you can, like wherever the state can help pay for. So we lived in the studio apartment and my poor mom, bless her heart. She, we came to us with one suitcase and I think she had $3,000 or something. It was something really small and she put it in an envelope and she put it uh, in the drawer under the stove. Like where you keep cookie sheets. I don't know. What do people put in there? I think it's a warmer, actually. You warm your food in it. She put it in there and the fucking fire started in the studio apartment and burnt everything. Our green cards, our social security, all the money we had. So my poor mom started over again. And anyways, we lived in a really shitty neighborhood and my mom was taking English classes, like you know, that was one of the requirements when we came here. You had to be yep. in classes. She was taking classes and the teacher happened to be someone who worked for a church in Wisconsin, Janesville, Wisconsin, which was about an hour and a half drive from Chicago north. And he said, we're going to have this church sponsor you. We're going to get you an apartment. We're going to get you a car. We're going to get you a job. We're going to get you an education. So sure enough, two years spent in Chicago, pick up again and move my whole life again. And we ended up in Janesville, Wisconsin. And that was like one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life. The people just took us in like family and it was actually a Methodist church. And I feel like I just owe those people. I actually just ran into one of them recently. I hadn't seen him in 20 years and he gave me a big hug and started crying. And it's just so cool to see the people how many people gave so much for my family. So that's yeah. one thing that I've just really loved is now looking back now, cause I'm at the age now that my mom was when she came here. And I'm just like, I cannot even imagine like she had to, uh, all her education, none of it counted here. All the multiple languages she spoke didn't count here. I just have so much respect. Oh, I just got goosebumps. And yeah. yeah. I like, got goosebumps you know, literally because none of it counted, none of it mattered. It's as if you got an eraser and you basically just erased your whole life. And nothing it, matters. Literally, it's like everything you and I have built in the last yeah. 26 years or however long, let's say, it's like then you just all gets rubbed out. It just doesn't yeah. matter what you built, what you did, who you were friends with, who you loved, who you did, like just none of it. Yeah. I just, and like now I as have... a mother, it just hits different. Hey, think about it like your parents, right? You think about yourself and everything you went through and we were what you and I were around the same age and you were 12, you said? I'm a year older than you. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> no, but I was, I was about like, God, I think five and a half-ish, almost turning six when we left Yugos- ex-Yugoslavia, I guess you could say. And then we were in Germany for, yeah, almost five years. And then I came here when I was like 12-ish, turning 12. And uh, yeah, that just, every, all your words. And, and yeah. The, like the shit you're saying is just literally in my brain. It's just that. You can just picture it. Is, oh, like I could, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Literally like mm-hmm. I was getting goosebumps mm-hmm. the whole time because it's as if it's on a cellular level because your body always remembers. And when you yeah. said abdomen issues, oh, that, I remember when my dogs died two years ago and I, it was like, okay, other people's dogs die as well every day. Like things die. Mm-hmm. That's life, right? That's the only, that's the only like certain thing that we know is going to happen. I took that so hard when my baba died or my grandma died. 
I took that like it, five years. I was sad, like for five mm-hmm. years. But like some people are like, yeah, look, I've got to get back into life again. I've got to go dance. I'm like, I'm not even dancing ever again. I just took things mm-hmm. so much harder. And when you mentioned abandonment and issues, like how can you not? And one of the things I said to my sister and my husband was, I feel like everything I loved always gets taken away from me. Absolutely. Everything. All my cousins that I had, all my uncles, all my aunties, yeah. all the things, I loved, my favorite fucking snacks, all these things, like minuscule little things and big things. So then when you c- create this new life and then something gets taken away that you love, you're like, this is so unfair. Of course, it's mm-hmm. unfair for everybody, right? But it's just this internalization of everything that I love gets taken away from me. Mm-hmm. And then everything. when you have kids, it's so scary because you're like, here's the biggest thing now that's walking outside my body and it's mm-hmm. just warm. So for you... Becoming a preteen, essentially. How was that journey like from teenagehood into your 20s? Describe mm-hmm. what that was like. Oh, man. It was, thinking back on it now, I, my teenage years, I was, I was in dull, I was like indulging in just the American. I wanted to be American. I wanted to be just like everyone else because I was never like anyone else. And that's one thing that's really hard is because I still to this day, and I feel like you could probably relate, I still to this day don't feel like I belong somewhere 100%. I don't belong in Bosnia 100%. I don't belong in Croatia 100%. I don't belong in America 100%. I just feel like I'm just in this limbo because I have pieces of me in different places and no one, I'm not 100% anyone. I'm not 100% anything. Like we talked off mic. I'm from Bosnia and I identify as Bosnian, but I also identify as Croatian because of my religion. But then I also like people in Croatia, they literally will comment about my Bosnian accent. In Bosnia, I'm just an American girl who's got this beautiful life. And in America, I have to work really hard to be and have what I have. And then even when I do work hard, people don't see all that hard work. They don't see all the trauma that I'm handling. They don't see all the things that come along with being the oldest daughter of a refugee woman. And I'm the generation. I'm the start of my kids are first generation. They're first Mm -hmm. generation immigrants. They're never going to have to live what like I lived, but I lived that. And so did my mom. And it, it was such a different impact that it had on me than it did my mom. But as far as transitioning from preteen to teen, moving around so much was hard. So like forming friendships was hard. And like you also said off mic, being hairy, like I was bullied (laughs) so bad in middle school. I was hairy. I was different. I had an accent. I had to take English second language classes. And so I had a lot of that. And then In high school, I finally felt like I belonged because I had a group of friends and, but high school was high school. Like, I think Mm -hmm. high school is hard no matter who you are, no matter what you are. And then I just really wanted to be just American. I didn't want anything to do with my other culture. I didn't want anything to do with being Bosnian because it just was easier and no one got it. No one understood it. I had no one to relate to there where we live. There are not that many Bosnian families and even the ones that were close it they felt far away like in Chicago the church we went to was all status and you know how it is with eastern european like balkan people it's all status who who looks who has more money who can pay for this who has yeah. the nicer clothes and me my mom and my brother we did it we were poor yeah. we didn't have that so I didn't belong even with the Bosnian kids because I had, or right. even with the, I'm sorry, they were Croatian because they were Catholic. And, but like, I was still an outsider. I had a Muslim dad and a Catholic mom. So like I was a mutt. I never really belonged. So I just didn't want to be associated. And I let that part of me go. And it wasn't really until I became an American citizen So I was a ref or I was an American resident. So in America, you become a resident. I don't know how it is in Australia, but you become a resident with a green card and a social security number. And then there are certain criteria you have to meet to become a citizen. And I had met all the criteria way long before. 
before. So all of us have, but my mom just could never afford to mm. get our citizenship. It was like 800 a person or something. And so I got my American citizenship in my early 20s and I went by myself and I was so proud. And that's when I was like, this is wild. Like I have this whole other life, this whole other story that no one really knows just because I don't talk about it. I don't share much. So I feel like I almost had a little bit of an identity loss and I still do like to this mm -hmm. day, I still have an identity loss. I still like I, I, my Bosnian culture and family and beliefs like pulls me so tight. But then at the same time, like I've lived here most of my life and this is where I've really identified as an American. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh, honestly, I can relate to like to every single element. Like being poor, man. Like poor as didn't even have couch. Didn't even have a couch. I had like this leather couch from Salvation Army with like a rip through it. It looked like somebody got a knife mm -hmm. and just sliced it. Yeah, and just that thing yeah. of look. The only thing that saved us here, I don't know in America what the schools are like in terms of diff different states, but we have school uniforms here, so that's the only thing that saved us. We all look the same. But if we had to go in everyday pay get clothes, we would all literally have clothes from the Red Cross, jeans, four sizes, too big. And I think it's so important to tell these stories because so much devastation and destruction and trauma has occurred. And then it, you go to these new places and it, it's as if nothing has happened, right? And like you're just walking around, I'm just walking around, and it's as if it just didn't bloody even happen. And you're supposed to just go on with your life, be grateful, we got our citizenships, we got jobs, whatever, like we're healthy, we're in a safe place and that's that. Just be content. But that's where shit starts to unravel. I remember even us just watching the Ukrainian war, like my mum was crying. Like when the floods happened here in Australia, my mum shed tears or the bushfires, you know, because every single little destruction in the world is this trigger because there's so much stuff that hasn't been dealt with. You said our parents didn't have time and space and the knowledge to deal with it and the awareness at the time. So it's become on us. And it always becomes like this heavy burden that you don't want to take, but you realize it's actually extremely important to take because what are our little kids going to do about it? But everything you said, just who am I, identity loss, like I'm writing it all down, like living in, in the in between, like I'm here, but I'm not here, not feeling yeah. present, not feeling grounded. I don't even belong with these Croatians who have been here. There's a lot of people that migrated to Australia in the 50s and I'm sure as well in the US, a lot of people migrated way before we did. So we were almost very late settlers, like settling in in the late yeah. 90s and 2000s. That was very late when you think about it. There are people that were here like 30 years before us, 40 years before us. Yeah. So it didn't even really fit in with them either. And exactly. everything you just said, like a bed of men living in them between identity loss so and just writing it all down because it's just all hitting home. So how, how did that impact you? in? Because you went into nursing which I didn't find that's actually like an uncommon thing to do because you have such a caring personality and obviously you wanted to be cared for in everything that you were going through so that it's almost like this, the career path chose you and you mm -hmm. chose it. So then how did that sort of evolve into becoming your career and then also meeting your husband? Did that all happen at the same time? Yeah. So I, I always wanted to, I remember as a kid, I always said I wanted to be a doctor and that was like one of my kid dreams. But then I didn't realize until probably my senior year of high school that I wanted to do social work. And the reason I wanted to do social work is because I just remembered and thought about all the people that helped us in our life. And there were so many people without the people that didn't help. Let me start that over. Without the people who help refugees and immigrants. I wouldn't be here and it takes a village. And I thought about all the people that did all the things for me. And there's so much like social work involvement in that. There's so much managing of someone's life in order to, for them to have a better life. And even though it wasn't one single person, it was a group of people. And I felt like I wanted to be part of that group of people. I wanted yeah. to be someone that can change someone's life for the better. And I wanted to do social work or counseling or something along those lines. And I don't remember when it all changed. Oh, no, I take that back. I do remember. I was given an opportunity to become a CNA, a certified nursing assistant. 
at age 16, I was approached by one of my teachers. It was a program they were doing. They were putting high school kids through it. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. And I said, yes. And at that time, my mom was a CNA. She was a CNA at a nursing home. And that was one of the programs she was put through when we first came to uh, Wisconsin. And that was my mom's, I don't, my mom was a cook. She was a cook in Bosnia. But she became a CNA and I got my CNA license at 16. So at 16 years old, I was taking care of people, like sick people. And so that's when it shifted for me. I decided I want to be a nurse. And it really was the greatest thing I ever did with my life to this day, other than becoming a mom. Becoming a nurse was something that I feel like truly was meant for me. It was truly something that I think was created for me. And I don't regret it. I don't have any doubts. I would do it a hundred times over again because I nursing isn't really, you're helping people, but you're also really helping people in all ways, like holistic ways. You're not just doing the medical portion of it. You're listening to people's stories. And I was, oh my God, this is so full circle for me. I graduated nursing school and I met my husband after I graduated nursing school. We started dating after, but I graduated nursing school and I got a job my senior year of college before I graduated. Sorry, I'm all over the place. (laughs) Before I graduated, I got a job at the veterans hospital. So the like VA, do you you guys have those there? Something Um, similar, yeah. Something similar. And I was like, I know nothing about like veterans. I know nothing about American military, really. So I got a job there and I swear it was like God literally picked me for nursing. He picked me for this job and it changed my life. And it was a full circle moment for me because there was literal American military men fighting for my life in Bosnia. And they were the people that like, it was the American military that helped me come to America. So it all just came full circle for me. Taking care of veterans is probably one of the greatest joys and greatest accomplishments I've ever done in my life. They are the most beautiful group of people. I I can't say enough good things about them. So being a nurse and ER nurse, especially is just really something so special. And I think I was just meant to do that. And I think my experience as a refugee and and my experience as someone who's got a lot of anxious attachment, abandonment issues, all of that experience has built my empathy up to extremes. And I just have such Mm. a sense of empathy for people. And then my husband, I met him right after I met my husband at my senior year of college and after and he's an army veteran. So isn't it? Cool? Wow. Honestly, the synchronicity. So like a child of war. And uh, yeah. looking after veterans. Mm-hmm. Sorry, my bloody throat. Who have given you a new start in this American life. And then on top of that, you end up getting with the guy. Or like the cherry on top is you meet this awesome guy. And he ends up being from that world as well. Like that. Yeah, and when you talk about God, I love that because I think we don't talk about faith in us and I think Mm -hmm. it's been washed down and diluted, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. online. And I always say to people, call it whatever you want to call it, God, universe, whatever, okay, higher power, higher source. And I love that you do mention that and you have mentioned that online and a lot of people are like around the Easter stuff that you posted and like, oh, what, God? They get a bit Mm -hmm. straight around that as soon as somebody mentions it. But I think it's important to mention because sometimes When there's nothing left, all you have is faith and that's all that's left, right? It's not until people get desperate, they look up and they're like, oh my God, please help me. Whereas like when everything's working out, no one asks God for anything. So I love that your synchrony sitting's all lined up like that. I want to highlight what you said there. When there's nothing left, all you have is faith. And I think that a lot of people, especially people who know me in real life and our social media, I don't think many of them have experienced the, when there's nothing left, because when you're five years old and you have nothing except your pillow and you're going on a bus to another country, like what is there else to look to? So having my faith and faith, I'm something, and I'm gauging that you have a similar vibe on this, but my faith, I got super close to God 
because of everything I went through, because God was the only person that heard me. And he was the only person that I knew was looking over me other than my mom. But I, I just lost everything and everyone in my life all the time. And the only thing that was ever a constant in my life was God. He was always there to listen to me. And I don't mean to go on a faith rampage here, but it really is something that is so intimate to me. And I don't feel like I need to yell it from the rooftops because I know where I stand with God. Yeah, I know where I stand with my faith. Yeah. And because of God, and it's sacred. I have all and the it's, things I have. But it's sacred. it's sacred as well. It's a sacred mm-hmm. relationship. And I think it's, yeah, it's really in mainstream culture become so diluted. Like, it's not normal to believe in God anymore, but it's okay to believe in crystals, which is cool too. Like the power of crystal power, like this whole living manifestation. If I just think it, it will, that's all become normal, but believing that's a source too. And I just say to people, whatever source you believe in and in how, whatever methods you use to get there, it doesn't matter. It's an intimate relationship. Conversations with God, there's books about it. It's beautiful. I love that you mentioned that. And I love that's a part of you. And it's an integrated part of you and your family. And we talk a lot about faith at home. We pray at night before we go to bed. And yeah, it's not stuff I really share or like outwardly, like you said, shout out. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, people shouldn't feel like they have to hide it either. And like what you said, it's that whole privilege of never having had lost it. If you've been in that privilege, that's what privilege is. They've never had a feeling. Like my husband, he's never had a feeling maybe until way later on in life that holy shit, everything can get taken away from me. That's never been his reality. So therefore he lives life very differently and takes risks very differently and just engages in life differently to me. Whereas I was always on that cautious end, but my God, I don't want to build too much because it's scarcity. But if I have all these things like house, car, life, money, all these things, oh my God, it can all get taken away from me. So it's like keeping yourself small for so many years is, is such a reality. There's so many complex layers that that comes into that. When did you start going to therapy? You talk a lot about mental health and therapy. When did that journey start? Did it begin before you became a mum or after? Like how did those two roads come together? After. So I started therapy in 2021 when my second child was born and I knew right away I needed therapy way sooner, but I, at the time I didn't know I had, I have anxiety at baseline and given my childhood traumas, big T's and little T's, I now know that I probably should have been in therapy my whole life, but I started therapy in 2021 and I had postpartum mood disorder. I was diagnosed at my six week postnatal checkup. And they basically were like, we're going to start you on antidepressants. And here's a card for a therapist. So I knew I needed help because I had this severe rage towards my toddler. So my baby had, I had a complicated pregnancy with her towards the end. I developed liver failure. So she had to be delivered early. So that was really stressful for me. And then on top of that, I had hypertension, postpartum, and then around six days old, she stopped breathing. And then uh, I had to resuscitate her. And then I went to my appointment and I was like, I'm so fucked up. I need help. I'm so fucked up. <laughs> my, the poor girl that was doing my intake. Not dealing with that, like average run of the real average Western person just going in with some little things. Yeah, I, that's yeah. how I felt the first time I talked to somebody. <laughs> but did, when you were talking, when you started, what was your general mood like? Because for me, when I tell my story, I just was, okay, we have an hour. So I was very matter of fact. I was like, okay, so this is what's happening. This is what's happened. This is where I'm at. And she's just looking at me. She's like taking notes. She's probably going, holy shit, man, this chick's going to need 50,000 hours with me. But I just did it so like matter of fact. Is that, did you feel Same. like very much in your head? Like it was just very much. No, I, I am a very like. like- I literally wear it on my sleeve. I literally went in and my first therapy and I was like, I'm a refugee. I'm an immigrant. This is how I was parented. This is it. Like, I was just like laying it all out there. I was like, I know I'm fucked. Okay. Like I already know. So where do you want to start? (laughs) But my reason for seeking therapy in the first place was I was having such severe rage that I was having intrusive thoughts of hurting my child. Not like killing him. I didn't want to kill him and I had no intention. But you know what? Just I just want to throw it out there. It is perfectly actually common that women have 
intrusive thoughts of killing their yeah. kids and with no intent, right? Yeah. The Anyway, I just want to throw yeah. that out there. If anyone no, That's an important thing to mark because yeah, I yeah. never you never before you become a mom, I will mention you never think I remember my husband making a statement and he's like, that won't happen to you. That can't happen to you. It was like, he's just around and he'd been through so much and all this. It was as if I could dodge the system, the matrix. Mm-hmm. I was going to be this unicorn of a mother. Like it's mm-hmm. sh- like sh- glitter, literally, quite literally. It's awful. What a pedestal you're on before you become a mother. <laughs> and then it humbles the shit out of you. Oh, it motherhood humbles you. It humbles you. It takes you from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows, and then you're literally having visions of trigger warning for anybody throwing your baby against the brick wall. You're like, oh my God, I'm just changing his nappy. Like what the actual hell is happening? And that yeah. is just, oh, and yet no one talks about it because I was like, if I say something, my kid's literally going to get taken away. I'm going to get put into a mental asylum. Yeah. Oh my God. It wasn't until my husband as well acknowledged it. Oh yeah, I have that. I think about that stuff all the time. And I'm like, and he just said it so casually nonchalant yeah yeah whatever so of course he cries or want to throw him against the wall but they don't and I, i'm like but when i was looking at him he was so calm changing his nappy and i'm like he's having the same thoughts why doesn't mm. anyone even say this and we're living the same house under the same roof yeah. and we're chatting every day but we're not really chatting and what yeah. you said just like telling somebody is so bloody freeing because mm-hmm. it's actually validating, acknowledging like, hey, you're not the only one. Relax. So many mums go through this. You go, what? Mm-hmm. Why doesn't anyone talk about this? So is that sort of where your journey started with sharing? Because I know obviously you're blogging yeah. and sharing. Is that Was it inspired by all of that as well? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I shared motherhood before I had my second. I, I would share like, so I started sharing motherhood because I was, doing I was practicing gentle parenting with my first child I was like I really want to be a gentle parent and I want to I don't want to yell I don't want to hit I don't want to do timeouts I want to learn how to parent my kid with respect and boundaries and that shit is hard especially when you weren't parented like that so I started sharing about gentle parenting and like the things that I was doing and how I was learning, how I was failing every day. And then I got a huge, like awesome response to that. Like I I grew a huge audience in the motherhood community. And then of course my postpartum mood disorder, I shared that, like, I literally have raw video of me and my highlights on Instagram saved crying. Like this is fucking hard. This fucking sucks. Like I was so scared to take antidepressants and I took everyone on the journey with me. I was vulnerable. I was raw. And then literally a year later, after a year in therapy, I was like, I'm starting a podcast because moms need, moms want to hear this. They want to feel less alone. They want to feel like they have a community and they need free resources. And I want to use my voice and my influence to get the free resources because getting resources as a mom especially mental health resources is especially free because let's talk about how expensive therapy is i don't know what it's like in america but it's not bloody cheap i tell you to heal heal yourself or make yourself better is not cheap and yeah that's also a privilege right like that we we have gotten to a stage in our lives where we can do that but at the same time why does it have to be a privilege everyone should have access to it so I love that because the name Mama Knows, like your podcast, I just I love it because every time it, my husband will go out, Vito doesn't take a jacket. He's like, well, he was freezing. I'm like, Mama Knows Best. And then you come out with your podcast, Mama Knows. That is such a good name because Mama yeah. literally does always know best. So I think it's, yeah. you know, oh, like such a full circle moment for you to be able to give back to your community in that way. Take us a little bit further back to let's move the needle to obviously when you're with your husband and your son was on the way. What was that journey? Obviously, you're married, you're nursing, and then you're pregnant. How how was that experience for you starting off motherhood that way? Oh my God. It was I was so oblivious. I was like my head was in a cloud. I was like, this is great. We're gonna be a happy family. I like want to slap myself and be like, girl, wake up. This shit is hard. I was so I was just like. And I thought I had it all under control. I thought I knew everything. I was, and I'm naturally a controlling person. Like I need to have control over things and I'm working on it. Okay. Do you think you were born that way? Or do you think your conditioning in your life turned you out to be like that? Because you couldn't control your circumstances growing up. And now all of a sudden you think you can. 
So that's a heavy question. I think that I think I have that personality trait of I'm very assertive, right? And back in the day, that's not cool. Like women shouldn't be that way. So as a child, I was always shut down. Like you're too much. Don't do yeah. that. You're too much. And now, I don't know. I think I was conditioned. You caught me off guard with that question. I do think that I was conditioned because I feel like now I want to control as much as I can so I don't lose it. Yeah, because control you know? equals security and safety or a sense of that. For yeah. me, yes, exactly. For me, having control gives me a sense of calm and security. And then I'm also very hyper aware of everything and I need to make sure that everything everyone is okay yeah and that's such a toxic trait like I'm working on it just put it that way but yes I do believe that I was conditioned because of the life that I had and because anxiety and I think there's a lot to say about being the oldest daughter of a single mother that's a refugee Mm -hmm. I always had to be I had to grow up yeah, I had, when you mentioned I was, you were 16 and you were starting like the nursing journey. It, it's yeah, 16. I was you doing paper, but you were actually 30 something years old in your head. Based like, on your experience, it aged you. So you like, weren't 16 inside, really. Well, let's be for real. I was doing my mom's taxes at age 11. Like yeah. I was I never really had that like childhood where I could just live free. I always had to worry. Yeah. Is my mom going to come back? Is I always worry. About that not animal. worrying, so, not worrying is a luxury. Like my husband, he bloody awesome guy. Okay, one day you'll meet Andrew, but he he has this luxury of not worrying, of just being really relaxed, and that has been so triggering. That has been so triggering in our marriage because I'm like, what? It's this perceived notion of that he doesn't give a shit, but in, yeah. I know that he gives lots of shits. Okay, about lots of things, yeah. but it's just this what you said, hyper awareness of gauging your mum's mood or your parents' mood or gauging the atmosphere at the doctor or gauging what's going to happen next. Like I should walk on eggshells. Like you have to become so super sensitive of your environment to to survive like that hyper tension, the hyper awareness. So then it translates in your marriage like I care so much and you care so little, right? Because I control it all. I run our whole life and you're just bloody sitting there watching TV, mate. What's going on? (laughs) I literally asked my husband the other day, I'm like, so do you like, are you thinking about, do you think about these things? No. Like, why, why do I need to think about that? I'm like, marriage tip, don't ask him. what the fuck? <laughs> don't ask him a question if you don't want to get upset. I've just learned the hard way. I just had that point, that moment that you just described, like, God, so many sliding doors moments and we live in opposite sides of the world. But I remember, like, putting me down one night and I was just so exhausted and we're crossing like ships in the night, like past our hallway. And I'm just like, did you ever just worry how you did that day? Yeah. Was yeah. that a good yeah. Like just the stress and the weight. And I, 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 I was just broke. It just looked straight at me. Literally. No. And it's like, not. <laughs> like in this little no. house. <laughs> no. and, like, and I'm like, I either want to just kill you right now, literally get a fork and stab it in your eyeball, or I just... I just felt so underwhelmed and overwhelmed all at the same time. And I went, okay. And I just went in the kitchen and ate some fucking bread or something. Can't even remember. I was just like living off ham and cheese toasties at that stage. But how, how did that translate in your marriage? Like how all those things playing out, just so many different layers are playing out. How did that impact your marriage? Like how, like the journey of being married and your family? Oh my God. I like, it impacted our marriage significantly and way more than I even realized until we started therapy. We started therapy last year and our marriage is great. Like, like you said, like Tom is amazing. He's a unicorn. Like he truly is a unicorn. He's a great husband. He's a great father, but my sense of my need for control and my need for knowing things and doing things a certain way And then his like relaxed nature. And then we both have ADHD. So that like that, I think that fucking pinned us against each other the most. Mm -hmm. But it affected our marriage. First of all, kids affected our marriage because it, we just didn't really have time for each other. Yeah. We started putting our marriage as second 
as the second most important thing. And it really should be the, the number one most important thing. Because when you don't have a healthy marriage, you don't have a healthy family. Yeah. And we became more distant with each other. We were fighting a lot. We, I just felt disconnected from him. And there's, it goes in spurts. It's like a roller coaster, right? Like you yeah. can have really good moments. You can have bad moments. And it depends on like the stage your kids are in too. Yeah. And yeah, so our marriage was definitely affected. But at the end of the day, like he gets me. He's the person that like knows the most vulnerable, raw side of me and vice versa. And he knows my trauma. He knows, like, we tell each other everything. There's no secrets. Like, we vent about each other's parents to each other. We're just very, we're best friends. Best friends. At the end of the day, we get it. We get each other. And we are willing to do anything and everything it takes yeah. to be better for each other. Yeah, to put in the effort. To put in the effort. And, and that's the thing, like what you said, sometimes it's not necessarily that you guys aren't in a good place, but it's just that one of the kids will be doing something or yeah. they're going through a phase. Or as soon as your kid gets sick, you're like, oh, fucking hell, here we go again. Like, yep. you just know what that's going to look like. There mm -hmm. goes date night. There goes this. There, there goes whatever plans you had. Like, I just get downright pissed off. Like, not at the fact that my child's unwell, but just oh, all this other shit that comes with it. And then the worry, like the constant worry. And I like what you shared on one of your stories when your little one was unwell, that even though I'm a nurse, I'm still Googling like the <laughs> symptoms and I'm still Googling what's wrong with her. And I was like, man, that makes me feel more human because I thought if yeah. I had this experience, then maybe I wouldn't be so worried. But I love that you openly share your, your journey with everybody. How, where do you find the balance with what you share and what you don't share like where is that line is there a line or is it just a matter of oh I'm just feeling it right now I'm gonna say it do you regret it after is there stuff like that he's oh please don't share that because I'm an oversharer that's just who I am and my husband oh, is you really oh he doesn't mind he's cool with whatever there's no secrets or, or anything but I'm always mindful that maybe like my siblings aren't cool with me sharing so much yeah parents, like, you know yeah that's so I'm definitely also an oversharer at baseline and I used to share everything and I've really scaled back as my social media account has grown. People can be really mean and I have to protect myself and I have to set boundaries. And sometimes I have these thoughts and I'm like, oh, I really want to share these and I really want to say this online. But then I'm like, nope, I can't. Someone's going to make it religious. Someone's going to make it political. Someone's going to say I'm a shitty mom. Someone's going to say I'm this and that. And all those thoughts, I'm like, and then it just puts me in this, nope, I'm not sharing it. But if it, if I had it my way, I would share everything. And I would just share my whole heart because that's just who I am. How do I find a balance? I share a lot of stuff, like my personal stuff, I'm an open book about. I'll tell you anything and everything about my mental health, my health, my whatever. The stuff between my husband and I, we have discussions about things that like I know what would make him feel ashamed and uncomfortable. And I wouldn't share that. I wouldn't yeah. share those like all like vulnerable details unless yeah. it was something that like we had already worked through and like we're on the mend and all's good. And I always ask his permission. My kids, I used to share a lot of parenting stuff and I used to share more things that like my kids would do and then how I would respond. I never shared my kids in their vulnerable moments, but now I'm just very, I've really scaled back. I don't really share much about my kids anymore because I don't want that to be on their digital imprint. I don't want yeah. people to like look back and say, oh, your mom talked about you in this light. And I'll still say I had a really shitty parenting day. Like I was yeah. a shitty, I felt like a shitty mom today. So I'll talk about parenting and how I handled mm -hmm. it. But I try to keep my kids. And I said, I don't know. I just have really good boundaries about what I share. It is hard for me to keep my sharing limited because it makes me feel like I'm not as honest I am honest, yeah, but yeah. I, I wish I could be more honest. Yeah, but, but if I the can. more comes, <clears throat> once again, my bloody throat. But yeah, with the more comes a cost, right? Comes a price because you think, what's the way up of this? Like this more, what's it, like, what's it costing? And is it actually going to get me any further or get make anybody else feel better or whatnot? Because you're already mm -hmm. doing a lot for your community. So at what stage did the nursing and 
digital content creation? Like at what stage did those two collide where you went, oh, was that a big risk? Was it a big decision or was it like a natural organic thing that had happened? Because I know you get a lot of questions in your stories of people being curious, like how did how do you have so much money to go on holidays every year and how do you this and how do you that? Mm-hmm. And that's the shitty thing about, yeah, being an online persona is having those sort of questions put at you. But I really like the way that you handle it and the way you answer it and you're always really authentic about it. So yeah, can you share a little bit on that 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 decision? Because it is quite a big decision to make. As far as as far as leaving nursing, yeah, like leaving yeah. full time nursing, yeah, yeah so that was hard for me emotionally to leave nursing full time because I love nursing. I love being a nurse. It's just who I am and who I identify as. But it got to a point where I was working so much, like I was working twelve hour shifts as a nurse multiple times a week. And I was trying to do social media. And then I was just making way more money on social media. And I had a lot more freedom. I was with my, I was able to be with my kids more. I was able to like do the things that I love, save money and more. And there was just so much, I saw a different potential in my job in social media. It gave me a sense of giving back in a different way, even though I'm not like healing people's physical wounds, I am healing people in other ways because of my vulnerability and because of who I am. So not an easy decision and I'm still a nurse, but it's, I'm just way less a nurse. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I I transitioned full-time social media in 2020. And one of the biggest driving reasons was COVID because it was Being a nurse during COVID was quite literally one of the, like I was having panic attacks. It was Mm -hmm. awful. Oh, honestly, like just seeing what was happening in the world and even here with like Australia so strict with what you meant. And you mentioned like your journey with the doctors and getting jabs and all. It's, yeah, very, but yes, the Western world obviously works very different to Europe and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I just commend you on being brave also because uh, the reason why I ask that question is because there is a lot of listeners, a lot of bums. Also, a lot of people that I work with on a day-to-day basis who always ask, like, how, how do I know? How did you start this? Or how did you start that? Or how can I make this happen? They have these how questions. And it's not always mm-hmm. so cutthroat. Like, it's not always so ABC, step one to 10, and that's it. You're no. free. It's not like that. It's just this feeling, right? It's mm-hmm. the four kicks the road. And, and it's that, like, the world situation that happened, it just forced you into making that decision that you already felt like you were going to make it. It was a no-brainer. Because you got mm. to help way more people, you got to spend mm. more time with your kids, and and you were doing something that you was that was bringing you satisfaction and that you were passionate about, and you got mm. to be creative. Because obviously, I can see you have a very creative flair about you as well. So how how do you stay creative? That's my biggest thing. There's just some days where I'm like, I don't even want to get on a story. I don't even want to share a post. I got nothing. How do you like when you get that paralysis, or if you do? Or if you don't, like, how do you deal with that? Because a lot of people would, a lot of creative people, a lot of people that work online, even people who have services like psychologists to counsellors. Yeah. How do you break out of that? How have you learned how to shift your energy, how to channel it? And then now you're like saying, I've learned to scale back a little bit. But then, yeah, how do you balance that online when online becomes your full-time thing? Thank you for listening to part one with Balkan Nina and Balkan Sis. Make sure you tune in to the next episode and find out what she had to say. So that was the episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. And as ever, if you did, please consider sharing it with your loved ones and leaving me a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. It really does make a difference to the number of Balkan sisters that we can reach with the brilliant wisdom that my guests and I share. Thanks for being here. Idovijenia.